Hello, my name is Mr. Cardinal C. McQueen, the Assistant Chemist here at the Food Safety and Testing Lab. And it's my pleasure to present to you on the topic of quality assurance in the food industry. Now, the food industry deals with extremely sensitive products. Think about it. It's what we eat. It doesn't get any more sensitive than that, and it impacts every single aspect of our lives. And it is exactly for this reason why it's so important for players in the food industry, no matter how major or how minor you think you are, to adhere to strict quality assurance protocols. All right, so consumers usually, well, we have a tendency to buy from the same places, to buy the same brands, and this is because we consider those to be good quality. You know, me personally, I'm a Subway guy. I don't have to guess, okay, I wonder if Subway could be on their game on Tuesday. No, they have a certain level of quality and consistency with their products that I trust and I keep going back because it's good. The reverse is also true. You could have a good experience with a product, show up one day, have a terrible experience with a product and decide that you never want to invest your money into it again. And quality assurance essentially focuses on getting that particular peak making sure that you actually get the quality that you want and also ensuring that you're able to replicate it or copy it or make sure that every single batch is the same level each and every time. But what is quality control? So, quality control can be defined as measures or steps taken to ensure a consistently good product. So, there are steps that you put in place to make sure that you get a product that's consistently good. Each and every batch that you make is the same level. You don't, have a ter you don't have a good batch on Tuesday and Friday because it's the end of the week, the batch is terrible. The batch has to be at the same level because it's going to affect your revenue. Once again, people go based on their experiences and you want them to have a good experience every single time they open your product because the product's gonna advertise for itself. So quality control can also be defined as a procedure or set of procedures intended to ensure that a manufactured product or performed service adheres to a defined set of quality criteria. So, that's a long fancy way of saying, it's a set of rules that are put in place to ensure that a product or a service is always at a particular level over and over again. So let's talk about the dimensions or the parts of quality control. So, first part, must meet consumer expectation. Because if it doesn't meet the consumer expectation, in other words, if it's not a good product, nobody's gonna buy it. They have to comply with the food safety laws of the country. That's why it's important for you to understand exactly what the laws are surrounding the product that you're gonna be working on, because it's gonna differ depending on what kind of product you're dealing with. And third, and of course, that has to be safety. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the, the manner in which quality, quality control procedures should be written. So we want them to be one, quick and as simple as possible. Quality control procedures have to be written with this in mind. Yes, you understand your product, you're a professional on your product, but, we're, but when we talk about quality control procedures, we're looking at having your business explode and expand and get to the point where you actually don't have to physically be in the vicinity for the work to carry place. So they have to be written down and put in such a manner where anybody can read them and understand exactly what it is that they're doing. So they should be quick and simple. They should give the necessary information to carry out the task. They should give enough information that the individual carrying it out understands what they're doing, why they're doing it, and also understands, okay, if they don't get a particular quality, what they need to do, but you don't need to give them so much information that you confuse them. So it's important to give them just enough information to get the task done and meet the, re and meet the required standard that you're looking for. They should be used to predict and control the quality of processed foods. So, Based on trial and error, you would know that based on doing specific things at one step, the product should be at a certain quality at, at a later step. Case in point, just as, a, just as an example, if you boil stone crab claws in a bath at a particular temperature, after a certain period of time, you trust that the claws would be cooked and safe for consumption at that particular point in time. So the procedures are set up in a manner where you're able to predict exactly what should happen to the product based on what you do at each step. How do we measure the quality of foods? The quality of foods or ingredients can be measured in various ways, including the use of quality attributes. Quality attributes are means or ways in which we measure the fitness of a substance or an ingredient. Now, what's important to understand here is that when we talk about the fitness, 
We're talking about how good the substance or the ingredient is. But that's actually going to be related to the product that you are working with. I'll give you case in point. My Grammy loves the baked banana bread. And I remember as a, ch I remember as a child growing up, she always would tell me, boy, and I go get some overripe banana. Because that's what, that's those are the bananas that are best for making banana bread. However, if you're, let's say you're dehydrating or you are um, making some banana chips, you're going to want to use firmer bananas, bananas not quite as ripe as they would be for banana bread. Not saying that the ingredients both aren't good, but depending on what the specific product is, you want the ingredient to be at a particular quality. So once again, you make a banana bread, you want to use overripe bananas. If you're making banana chips, you may want to use bananas that are just ripe, but still pretty firm. So some of the attributes that we could use here are size, hardness, and damage. And we're going to go over examples of how you would use them. And once again, it's very specific to the product in which you're making. Some of these attributes will apply to the product you're making. None of these attributes may apply to the product that you're making. That's why it's important to understand exactly what it is that you're, you're processing, what it is that you're producing, and what you need in order to get that product from raw material to finished product. Here's an example that we're going to look at. So an example of quality attributes for tomatoes used for tomato paste. So the first attribute we're going to look at is color. So in this column, we have color. The accept condition is orange slash red. And we reject if it's more than 10% red. So what are we saying here? So to break, all, to sort of break all of that down, what we're saying here is that the tomatoes that we need for tomato paste, we need them to be ripe. And one of the ways that we're going to identify whether or not it's ripe is based on the color. And we reject it if it's more than 10% green. So if it's more than 10% green, we're saying that it's really not ripe enough for this particular batch of tomato paste that we're making. So the next attribute we're looking at is size. And in this particular, we accept any size. We don't reject it under any circumstances. Shape, we accept any shape. We don't reject under any circumstances. And this is kind of along the lines of what I mentioned before about specific quality attributes aren't necessarily going to be as important as others. It's really all dependent on the product which you're going to end up with. Hardness, so soft to over soft and we reject if it's more than 10% hard. And if you actually combine hardness and color together, essentially you get a profile for whether or not the tomato is ripe. And the reason why it's more effective to spell it out this way is because, once again, you may be starting off your business as the person who's doing all of the hands-on work, but we're looking for the business to expand and to bloom. When you get to the point where there's other persons actually doing the work, they're not gonna necessarily always handle it with the same level of care and or understanding as you. And so by spelling it out in this manner, what you do is, even if the tomato makes it past the color stage, if it's not fully ripe, it probably won't make it past the hardness stage. And that's going to make sure that you get only the tomatoes that are at the particular quality that you need to get into your product. And, in, and damage. So in this, in this particular case, under damage, we have mold. And we don't accept any, any evidence of mold. We don't accept it at all. All right, let's talk a little bit about food processing. So food processing can be defined as any of a variety of operations by which raw foodstuffs are made suitable for consumption, storage, or cooking. So food processing is the way in which we take raw food and raw ingredients and we convert that into something that's safe for human consumption, for storage, or something that'll be ready to be cooked. All right, so let's look at a quality control checklist for foods, food processing. Temperature, pH, moisture, water activity, and sugars. So these are just the parameters that we're going to be looking at today, but there are others that you can, that you can, that, that can be relevant depending on which product you're operate, you're using. All right, so temperature. One of the critical factors in controlling pathogens pathogens, little microorganisms that get into our bodies that make them sick. In food, is controlling the temperature. Disease-causing microorganisms such as bacteria grow very slowly at low temperatures and multiply rapidly in mid-temperatures and kill completely at a very high temperatures. And the reverse is also true. When we freeze substances, what we do is freezing actually prevents the microorganisms from being able to access the water that they need in order to grow. So extreme hot, extreme cold, very poor for microorganisms. So case in point, 
You may want to freeze a product in order to preserve it or in order to assist you in transporting that product from one place to the other. Freezing it is going to la allow it to last longer. Cooking it under high temperatures is going to make it safe for human consumption. So this is the way in which you could, in real life, use these um, different characteristics. We measure temperature using thermometers, various types. All right, next we're going to look at pH. So pH is, the measure, pH is the measure of hydrogen ions in concentration. Now what does that mean? pH simply means, refers to whether or not something is acidic or basic, or how acidic or how alkaline or basic a substance is. And pH is commonly measured on a scale ranging from 0 to 14, with 7, with 7 being neutral, below 7 being different degrees of acidic, above 7 being different degrees of basic. And there's typically a color associated with each number on the scale. Okay, so let's look at some foods. Alkaline foods, pH is above 7. Example, eggs, soda crackers. Low acid foods, pH is around 5.0 to 7. Meat, fish, poultry, these are, those, these are the kind of foods that you find in that particular area. Medium acid foods, pH about, around pH 4.5 to pH 5. Soups, pastas, acidic foods, pH 3.7 to 4.5, peaches, oranges, tomatoes, and high acid foods, pH 2.3 to 3.7, lemon, and pickled products. So, the natural pH of foods can determine the type of organisms that can grow and survive during storage. Lowering the pH by adding acid dents or through fermentation, activity results in improved antimicrobial effects. So essentially what we're saying here is that one of the ways in which you can prevent microorganisms from actually affecting your product is by manipulating or controlling the pH. You could add certain substances to make it more acidic. You can add certain substances to make it more basic. But pH also has what I would consider to be an even more prevalent and immediate effect. Certain products have to be at a specific pH or a specific pH range in order to be satisfactory. Case in point, jams and jellies have a tendency to gel at about 3.2 pH. So with what that means is in order for you to get the consistency that you want, you have to get it to that particular pH. Okay. And we measure pH using pH meters. You can also use, a P, you can also use pH paper. All right, moisture content. So moisture is simply water diffused in relatively small quantity. Nearly all material contains at least a small volume of moisture. Moisture can be thought of as the amount of water in a material or substance. Now, why is moisture important? Well, moisture is important for a variety of reasons, including legal and labeling requirements, economic reasons, microbial stability, food quality, food process and operations. So to go over those real quick, so when we're talking about legal and labeling requirements, and let's combine that with economic, the, mo the more water that a substance contains, the heavier it is. In some cases, some products are sold based on their weight. And so case in point, let's say you have some, let's say you have some crawfish tails, and the crawfish tails contain a lot of water. When you sell those tails, you, you typically sell them based on their mass. Well, if those tails have a lot of water inside them, the more moisture, the heavier they'll be, the more they'll be sold for. Next, we'll look at microbial stability. Like I mentioned before, microorganisms need moisture in order to actually multiply, to grow, in order to do what it is that they do. And so knowing the moisture content lets you know the manner in which you can store the substance. The less water that's available to microorganisms, you can store them one way. The more water available to them, you know that, okay, well, I have to store this this particular kind of way. I may need to freeze it. Food quality, moisture affects, moisture affects the taste. We have a demonstration right here. We have, a bunch of, we have a bunch of grapes and some raisins right next to them. And the primary difference between the two of them is the moisture content. The grapes, the grapes were dehydrated and then the raisins. We determine moisture using drying, oven drying methods distillation methods, chemical methods, and physical methods. 
and the formula to calculate the moisture content is simply initial weight minus final weight times 100 all divided by the initial weight so you would weigh the product before you, before you dehydrate it you would weigh it after you dehydrate it the before is the initial weight the final weight is after it's dehydrated and then you would plug those values into that formula in order to get the moisture content okay so what activity what activity refers to the availability of water in a food or beverage and represents the amount of water that's available to microorganisms. The difference between water activity and moisture content is moisture content typically refers to all of the water in a substance. Water activity refers to what's known as free water. Now, how this works is, take our bodies for example. Within our, bo our bodies are made up of cells. In those cells, there's moisture contained. There's water in them cells and there's water outside of those cells. The water in cells isn't typically available for microorganisms because in order to get to that water you have to break the cells in order to access it so the water that microorganisms can just get to without breaking through cells we call that free water and that's the water they typically have access to so water activity refers to the water that's not tied up in other things case in point if you make a if you make a if you make some lemonade and you dissolve some sugar inside of it some of that water is actually tied up with the sugar and that's the reason why it dissolves. And so the water that's tied up with the sugar isn't available for microorganisms to use right away just because it's already mixed in with something else. So water activity refers to the water that's just free and available to be used. Water activity is measured using water activity analyzers. They come in various shapes and sizes and models. All right, refractometers. Refractometers are simple instruments used for measuring concentration of aqueous solution. So, back to the example of lemonade. That's a solution, an aqueous solution, meaning that it's a solution, meaning that it's something dissolved in water. What a refractometer would allow you to do is it'll actually allow you to measure the concentration or the amount of, in this case, sugar dissolved in that body of water. And bricks is the term used when a refractometer is equipped to the scale. The scale actually measures, measures in, in bricks. Now, why is it important to use a refractometer? Essentially what happens is, when you typically make a batch of substance, let's say you make a batch of jam and you add sugar to it, you don't add sugar to the individual bottles, you add sugar to the entire batch. But how, but how are you supposed to know exactly how the sugar is going to be distributed in each, in each bottle after you would have mixed it through? You can use a refractometer to tell you what the overall concentration is in the entire batch that you would have already made. So how the refractometer works is, you have a portion that you can look through and you also have a portion that has a plastic seal on the top. You lift that up, you place a small amount of the sample on the prism, you close the lid, you hold it up to a light source, you look through it. What happens is the light that's going to pass through that substance, through, to, through the prism, is going to bend at a certain angle depending on how much dissolved substances is in it. So in this case, we're talking about sugar and refractometers are specific to what you're trying to measure. So there's some refractometers for sugar, for example, then there's other refractometers for salt. And so what the refractometer is gonna do is based on the, the way, based on how much the, um, the light actually bends when it passes through that particular substance, it lines up on the scale that you're going to be looking through and where those two colors meet is going to tell you what the bricks percentage is and that's going to tell you what the concentration of the sugar is inside, inside your um, product. Okay, so let's talk about HACCP real quick. Now, HACCP is an acronym that stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. So HACCP is a tool that can be useful in, in the prevention of food safety hazards. While extremely important, HACCP is only one part of a, of a multi-component food safety system. HACCP is not a standalone program. Other parts must include good manufacturing practices, sanitation, standard operation procedures, and personal hygiene program. So essentially a HACCP program is, a food safe, is, a food, is an overall food safety program that, oper that operates under the principles of identifying the hazards, analyzing them, identifying the critical points in your operation, and controlling those hazards. 
and it, and it brings all of these together to create the HACCP program. And you may say, okay, why, does all of that, why is all of that necessary just to identify a hazard? I know what hazards are. Well, in this particular industry, it's not always easy to identify specifically what a hazard actually is. Case in point, we're looking, we're looking at some very moldy sausage here. The mold is actually around the sausage, that white fuzzy substance that you see, that's actually the mold. And that's actually some of the most delicious sausage you'll ever have. The mold is actually a part of the manufacturing process because the mold actually, actually assists in getting the particular flavor that you want in, in the sausage. However, that's why it's important for you to understand the product that you're working with and also understand the, the process that's necessary in order for you to get the end product that you want. Because you can't just look at all molds, for example, and say that, okay, no, we don't want mold in our product. Now, no, we don't want to use moldy tomatoes, for example, to make our tomato base. But in the case of this sausage, for example, this particular type of mold is absolutely necessary for you to get the end product that you want. So another example we have here is some blue, is what I think most of us recognize as blue chias. So in this case, once again, the mold is actually used to and is actually used to generate the particular flavor